Um, good morning, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, <coughs> more of a pleasure than having to hold a chicken in the House of Parliament, which is where this uh, photo was taken. But what, what, it, what it illustrates is actually, um, in spite of the fact that actually many people believe we are very, very hygienic um, these days, and that might have uh, consequences, what this was was a campaign to try and illustrate to people that actually uh, the, the methods of the past, which might have been handed down through generations of washing meat, in this case chicken, isn't particularly good in terms of uh, reducing the likelihood of you getting food poisoning, and especially if these uh, bacteria are, are antibiotic resistant. So what I'm going to uh, talk about today is a little bit uh, is to pick up some of the issues that Tim has already raised, but perhaps to offer a little bit more uh, detail in terms of the role that the food supply chain and food itself might have in this. I'm then going to say why the Food Standards Agency is involved and the interest it has, and, and, and then end that a little bit with some of the things that we are currently doing in the space of antimicrobial resistance. I think there is no doubt as Tim has highlighted, and, and, and Dave Sally will do a much better job than I uh, later today on this, is the fact that actually, as the World Health Organization mentions here, is that it's, it's pretty hard to imagine what the world will be like if we don't have access to a whole range of antimicrobial organizations. Most people tend to focus on antibiotics, but if you take antibiotics, many, many routine operations would not occur if we didn't have antibiotics. And, and actually, my, uh, my own father-in-law effectively was born before antibiotics were kind of widely used and is still alive. And it's hard to think that in, perhaps within a generation uh, that particular situation can occur. And David Cameron has himself um, ma raised major concerns in this. That's why he appointed Dame Sally Davis to champion the antimicrobial resistance agenda and interestingly, the series of reports by Lord Jim O'Neill, the, uh, the economist that introduced the BRIC terminology into economics, has actually put, started to put some of the economic values on it that Tim has already mentioned. It's, it, it's somewhat sad, but perhaps reflective of the world that we live in, in that whether it be climate change or whether it be antimicrobial resistance, an economic value on it often pushes people to respond in a way in which people's values and culture and life, etc., changing, doesn't. There is no doubt that it's grabbing huge amounts of attention, as shown here in terms of a number of um, headlines. And as um, Tim has kind of produced, in fact, uh, if you work with, uh, with ministers on a regular basis, there are several newspapers which uh, worry them or uh, make them act in a way that others don't. The Daily Mail is the most significant newspaper in Parliament in terms of what that might actually mean. And in terms of numbers of people, as we have here the Sun, there was a headline in the Sun last week which instigated various actions from the Cabinet Office in terms of, this was the front page headline of the Sun last week talking about actually eating rare meat could kill you. This um, is the arrival of calistin resistant bacteria into England now. It's been uh, firstly reported in the Lancet in China, it's already in, um, in Denmark, but Denmark is actually one of the best countries in terms of limiting the amount of antibiotics used in farming, and in England now it has um, been found. For those that don't know, colistin is the kind of the last resort antibiotic often used in hospitals when most other antibiotics are not working. So th uh, this is a pretty serious um, finding. There is no doubt that this is a global problem. I think that's important, and I think Tim highlights the importance of having networks within Southampton and networks within the country. But I think what the Jim O'Neill report and what Dame Sally, Davis, Dame Sally Davis are championing is the fact that actually globally we need to respond to this. So here you have some figures in terms of economic, interestingly, economic costs from the US in terms of what antibiotic resistance costs. Deaths from Europe in terms of antimicrobial resistance, and then in terms of Australia, the actual amount of antibiotics which are imported there. In, in, in Australia, 80% of the antibiotics being imported are for livestock um, production. So whether it be Europe, US, or Australia, and obviously we could get similar figures um, from Asia, 
the problem is global. And that means there's a global message in terms of the need to act. And you will read so much about kind of we need to act in, in one sector or another sector. But I think as, as, as Tim began to um, highlight, I, I, I think it's really important to realise that actually the use of antimicrobial resistance throughout the environment, whether that be in farms, in the environment in general, in hospitals and GP practices or wherever, is all contributing to this particular issue. And it wouldn't be particularly sensible to blame one particular aspect or only act on one aspect. And that's why people are kind of working together. As you can see in the, uh, the bottom, if this works, does this work? It doesn't work. Uh, in, in, in the bottom um, right on your side there is, is the types of, uh, of practices which are known to contribute to antimicrobial resistance. And as you can see, there is a, it, there's one to do with overuse of antibiotics in livestock and fish farming, and another in terms of lack of hygiene and poor sanitation. So those are ones which undoubtedly the production of food, the consumption of food, etc., contribute to antimicrobial resistance uh, becoming a problem. You can see others there which are kind of, I'm sure people will talk about more um, regularly. In terms of um, the, uh, the issue to do with kind of bacteria, Tim kind of mentioned this a little bit, is actually one of the things which is really fascinating is actually the amount of bacteria that is in the human gut in the first place. The human microbiome is about to go through a revolution in terms of what the relevance of the human microbiome is to health in general. Within the Food Standards Agency, we are very interested in the fact that how the human microbiome might make you less susceptible to exposure to a food pathogen. It might make you less susceptible to various toxins such as acrylamide and a whole range of other things which are produced in food. It also is showing signs of actually perhaps being involved in the onset of allergies and it also seems to be potentially linked with various dementias and a whole range of other issues. So this microbiome is absolutely essential to your everyday life. So therefore, a take-home message, which nobody in this room doesn't need to know, but actually, bacteria inside you are good. But there are some bad ones. So therefore, one of the problems of antibiotic resistance is to offer an antibiotic which dramatically changes your microbiome such that the actual resistant ones are still there doing the function which you don't want, and many of the functions which you do want have been actually removed. So that's why it is actually important to understand uh, when to prescribe an antibiotic, when not to, and not just from a resistance point of view, but because of this microbiome um, aspect. Here we have an example in terms of uh, from the European Centre for Disease Control, which talks about the costs to the um, EU healthcare in terms of resistance. But importantly, around there shows some well-known. Um, bacteria which are, are causing big problems and the one of most relevance to us in the Food Sanitary Agency is uh, E. coli and as you can see there E. coli from actual member states across the European Union of 28 member states is 57.4% resistance to, I can't read actually on my own slide, I apologise for that, the, the particular antibiotic that's um, concerned there. But what, what it shows you is a whole range of antibiotics, a whole range of bacteria and resistance is frequent across the member states and that becomes an issue. So last week Jim O'Neill, as I said, the, 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 the famous economist, um, published I think an important review. The important review to me was the fact that when I first became involved in this, uh, uh, this discourse about 14 months ago, it was quite interesting when one spent time with either medics or vets in terms of a slight sort of blame game, in terms of kind of which one was contributing more of a problem than another. And, and what Jim O'Neill's report, I think, has done very well is by t adopting a systematic type review, probably not Cochrane standards for a range of reasons, but a, a, a systematic review, he demonstrated that in the sort of 140 or so papers um, which were looking at the use of antibiotics or antimicrobials in agriculture, it said that 114 of those actually made some link between that use and antimicrobial resistance in humans. 
And of those 114, 100 of them were what he called an academic paper. In contrast, um, 15 um, studies show, said there was no evidence of that. But of those 15, less than half of those were what were deemed academic studies. So I think what this is kind of showing you is not only the, the weight of the evidence is beginning to show that antimicrobial resistance in humans is linked to the use of antibiotics, etc., in agriculture, but not just the weight, perhaps, the, but the quality of the evidence too, in the sense of the, the, the kind of proportion of those studies which are associated with an academic study. So what this illustrates to you is actually the kind of the various perceptions of the medical profession in terms of their views, in terms of the use of antibiotics in, in agriculture, etc. But more importantly, perhaps, is the the slide that was on the, the part of the slide on the right there. Um, this is from the from, from the US, but actually, and Tim has quoted 70%. But actually, what this shows you is the percentage of antibiotics sold for meat and poultry production in the US compared to, to treating sick people. So in this case, it's 80% uh, in, in, in US and livestock. This has some rele relevance and, uh, because actually the TTIP negotiations, which are happening at the moment, they're the transatlantic trade partnership discussions between US and the EU, have some relevance in terms of the free flow of food products between the US and the EU, and the discussions are happening between the, between the Commission and the US as I, as I speak. Dame Sally will quote to you that actually quite, if you um, have uh, salmon from uh, some North American uh, sources, not all, but some, the salmon will have consumed more antibiotics in its life than it weighs at the moment you actually eat it. So, so therefore, in terms of that intensive fish farming, it's is a, is a pretty significant amount is being used. So what does this mean in terms of the food chain? So as you can see at the top there, and, and, and Tim has already explained some of this, is you can see how, for instance, a resistance potentially develops in, in a livestock um, situation. And then how that livestock, either via food or contamination of that food onto surfaces, or um, I apologise for this in using the American slide that talks about when animals poop, but that is actually one, one of the uh, big spreads of, say, chicken and Campylobacter is the actual presence of the of uh, antimicrobial resistance in the feces, so that only one chicken in the flock of 40,000 potentially it can spread very quickly. And then you can see in terms of the exposure to humans, in terms of either contaminated food or actually in a contaminated environment, and then the, also the impact it has on humans. So you can begin to see, therefore, a reasonably plausible causal flow from how resistance might occur in animals to then have uh, an implication in terms of um, humans. And there are a number of preventative type measures, so these are kind of trying to reduce the likelihood of that spread, and you can see here there's lots of recommendations, etc., how that may happen. So as Tim perhaps alludes to, this might be all considered as measures to try and buy time, or to try and perhaps reduce some of those rather dramatic figures that I highlighted to you. So that having set the scene, the second half of my um, talk is going to function on why the Food Standards Agency uh, is involved. And for those who don't know, the Food Standards Agency was established by an Act of Parliament in 1999 and set up in April uh, 2000. And the, the, uh, a big driving force between the, the, uh, for creation of this uh, agency was the actual uh, consequences of salmonella in eggs and, uh, and the BSE situation, which led to a, a call for, in terms of food and that in the UK, the need for an arm's length body from government. So actually the Food Standards Agency is unusual because it is actually a government department, it's a non-ministerial government department, we do not report to any other government department, we report directly to Westminster and all the devolved parliaments um, through health ministers. So actually through health and not through agriculture and we are independent. So we're not like many agencies which you might hear about, which are either Public Health England, which is Department of Health, or the um, uh, things like veterinary agencies, which are part of DEFRA. We are a non-ministerial government department. What we do is in our new strategy is that we, 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 we try to ensure that food is safe and what it says it is. That 
ranges from toxins to pathogens to allergies. Uh, and um, what it says it is in terms of the fact that actually many products on the UK market, which is now 186 countries in the world supply food to the UK, are labelled sometimes differently from what you actually think. So in some cases that creates a real concern, such as horse meat, and in others, for instance, it's a concern perhaps in terms of uh, health, because every time the world's spice prices go up, people cut spice with nuts, peanuts. And therefore, that's a way of making large amounts of money from the world's spice prices, but anyone allergic to peanuts is potentially going to be exposed. Another example is it may be quite shocking for anybody in here who spends large amounts of money on manuka honey, but there's more manuka honey sold in the UK than is actually produced in New Zealand. So there clearly is something going on in terms of which doesn't quite match up. When you're, trying, when you're paying 40 or 50 pounds for honey, it is going to attract people who think this is quite a good way to make money. So, so therefore, sometimes it's authenticity, other times there might be a real health concern that people are buying something because they think it's actually going to make them healthier. So, what about uh, antimicrobial resistance in the food chain? So we are very, uh, the big um, top draw issue we look at is Campylobacter. This causes 280,000 food poisoning events in the UK per year, costing the UK economy £900 million. And we have been sampling Campylobacter to see how prevalent it is, but what is slightly worrying is the amount of uh, increasing resistance of Campylobacter that you find to fluoroquinolones, the principal antibiotic used against um, Campylobacter. So, for instance, a, a Daily Mail headline from just literally a few months ago, a few weeks ago, 76% of the chickens that are um, uh, sold in the major supermarkets contain traces of Campylobacter. And I know that um, we're, we're, we're very interested in how that can be reduced by either by security on farms or actually in the processing stage, which where some of the technologies that I've seen here could have a, a relevance. So clearly, as I said, 280,000 people, 900 million. However, if antimicrobial resistance were to increase in this Campylobacter system, then that cost could be significantly more. But it's not just um, Campylobacter. So we, as you can see there, this is based on European Union summary of the actual percentage of bacteria presenting microbial resistance reported by member states. So as you can see, whether it be chickens themselves, the actual product you buy, or cows, Campylobacter on the top there, which begins to show you the amount of re resistance that is found in some populations across these member states to fluoroquinolones and to macrolides on the right there, and you have a salmonella situation too. So therefore, the frequency of antibiotic resistant bacteria in frequently consumed food products in Europe across 28 member states is present. Okay, so there is no um, debate about that. So how do we go about addressing or approaching this risk? Well, we assume that we are going to try and get the best scientific advice and acknowledge the uncertainties. And that might mean sometimes after a risk assessment is made, a decision is made on that, but you might have to come back and reassess that decision in the basis of new evidence. So we're very keen on the concept of certainty and weight of evidence. So for instance, I've been proposing to our board the use of Sir David Spiegelhalter's one to four star quality evidence scheme, which is the one star could perhaps me be a quick survey of all of the people in this room, in which if I then use that as an evidence to drive policy, I would not be surprised if I interviewed 100 people somewhere else and got a very different answer. Two star is a little bit more. That four star is where you always want to be, you're not going to expect change. Two star is where we're in this sort of often precautionary principle. So that actually it would not be that surprising for the information to change and you might use a precaution principle in terms of a decision. Ultimately we'd like to move in the three star space in which it's quality evidence. It might change but not likely to change dramatically so, so that therefore you have to change you know, your policy. And that's where in terms of that openness and that honesty in that communication, being very clear that with the evidence that we have, this is the decision that we are making, if that evidence were to change then we would come back, reassess the situation, and perhaps make an alternative decision. So how do we gain this sort of information? Well, right across government, 
There are scientific advisory committees, I should imagine many people in this room sit on them. In the Food Standards Agency, we look after six committees, one of which is the um, Advisory Committee on micro <coughs> Microbiological Safety in Foods, the ACNSF. And the AS AM ACNSF was set up before the actual Food Standards Agency existed, so in 1990, on a recommendation of UK health and agricultural ministers. And, and the, the remit is to assess the risk of humans and microorganisms which are used or occur in food and to advise us, the FSA, on matters relating to microbial safety of the food. Why is that important? Well, they produced a number of reports, as you can see, they produced a report in 1999. So this issue is not new. It's grabbed a lot more attention recently, but in 1999 a report came out. What we are keen on is the fact that they, in 2013, we commissioned that group again to produce a working group to look at where we are currently in terms of antimicrobial resistance. And they were established in July 2013, so about 18 months ago, and they are working with us to try and give us the state-of-the-art information, and they've actually helped uh, draft the, the remit for a systematic review. So what are some of the challenges? Well, some of the challenges, as I said here, is the complexity by which the route of transmission from animals to uh, people can occur through food. Uh, the, the, the issue that the actual the control is actually controlling in both of those sectors, not just one. And, and that we can actually get resistance for either from directly from the human pathogen itself or from uh, commensal bacteria. Resistant genes can be transferred, we heard a lot about that. The complex nature of the global sourcing of food, etc., makes tracing in contaminated foods very difficult and, and monitoring the situation so you can move towards this more free star, four star information. Well, I'm quite happy to talk about some of those things later to people if they would like to know. So, obviously, quite often you have to work under EU legislation. And EU legislation in 2013 lays down specific technical requirements for testing antimicrobial resistance. And as I've kind of highlighted to you, we regularly are testing for E. coli um, and a whole range of other bacteria and, and, and to some extent viruses, uh, so that we can actually have a, a baseline to we can pick up trends of how things are changing. So as you can, as you I highlighted to you before, we are looking at how Campylobacter is actually potentially um, uh, increasing the amount of resistance <coughs> in our work. And as I said, we have just commissioned a systematic literature review to be able to give us the range of information in the same way as that Jim O'Neill report did a systematic review to look at what papers are out there saying it is involved or not. We uh, have commissioned the Royal Vet College in August 2015, which will report in March next year, to give us an understanding of the role that food production, processing and consumption has in the development of AMR. So I've painted perhaps somewhat of a slightly worrying situation, but I think the one thing to really um, highlight is actually, in terms of uh, you and at this moment in time, we still suggest to people that the 4C principles in terms of handling food is really critical. So that if you cook food properly, you chill food appropriately, uh, you clean food and the surfaces on which it's been present, to avoid any form of cross-contamination. Then, whether you be in a restaurant, whether you be in a supermarket, whether you be cooking at home, those practices will destroy bacteria which is present, whether it's antimicrobial resistant or not. What we're talking about here is actually, if it's antimicrobial resistant and you don't do these things, the ability to deal with it is much trickier. But the antimicrobial resistance as such isn't going to change these basic messages, which are absolutely critical. If you want more information, uh, we are food.gov.uk, and if you want to find more about the, anti um, the Advisory Committee on Microbial Safety in Foods, that is their website. Um, there, They are always looking for members, and uh, being a member of a committee like that, which can contribute to a report, which can influence funding, and potentially be an impact case study, I would ask you all to consider joining our committee's office. Thank you.